February 8, 1947, was supposed to be a night filled with celebration for the residents of Spandau in Berlin, Germany. They were hopeful that normality was near now that World War II was over. A party would kick off the carnival season in Berlin, but sadly, calamity struck. A fire that broke out in the ceiling of the Karlsluhe dance hall quickly turned into the worst fire disaster in post-war Germany. What led to this devastating fire? A careful analysis revealed a set of unfortunate events that all came together to culminate in tragedy. Karlslust was the largest dance hall and restaurant in Spandau, a borough of Berlin in the post-war British sector. The building was formerly a German jail for prisoners of war, and it became famous for its legendary parties. The former prison had been renovated by adding lower false plywood ceilings over the ugly roof. This left a gap between the two ceilings where dust silently gathered. The plywood was decorated with pretty paper, which was also highly flammable. The highly anticipated Saturday night fancy dress ball would take place at the two-story building owned by Julius Label and his family. Label secured permission for a lifted curfew from the occupying British Army, allowing partygoers the rare chance to stay out late. The excitement buzzed around the town especially after many years of the war. The dance hall's capacity was 700 people. However, the party was so popular that 750 tickets were sold. In the end, it is estimated that more than 1,000 were in attendance when the ball began at 8 p.m. Winter in Berlin is bitterly cold and snowy. In fact, that night the temperature was as low as minus 25 degrees Celsius or minus 13 Fahrenheit. The dance hall was generally comfortably heated by iron potbelly stoves. In preparation for the party, Label had moved in a third iron stove and placed it in the center of one room, running the stovepipe up through the false ceiling. He surrounded it with wooden chairs to keep partygoers from bumping into it and burning themselves. Having successfully heated the hall with iron potbelly stoves before, it seemed as though nothing could go wrong. So, what changed? As people arrived at the party, they checked in their coats at the closet by the entrance. To people of Berlin, coats were highly precious. Without one, they risked freezing to death. And due to the shortage of materials and funds, it wasn't easy to purchase a new one. After that, guests made their way through the small entryway into the main ballroom. It had several doors and windows, but many windows had been bricked over due to the building's previous use as a prison. Those that remained were barred shut. The ballroom's back exit was frozen shut due to the cold weather and snow, leaving only one entrance and exit, which was only about 130 centimeters, or about four feet of space. In other words, not a lot of room for 1,000 people to pass through. Over half of the guests at the party were between 17 and 19 years old. British soldiers were also in attendance. Everyone was having a wonderful time for the first three hours of the party. While people were dancing in the ballroom, the third iron stove added earlier was quietly heating the building. Its stovepipe was mistakenly touching a truss holding up the room, causing the wooden beam to smolder. Eventually, the temperature in the dust-filled gap between the ceilings reached a tipping point, igniting with no warning for the partygoers below. A flash flame rolled through the space between the two ceilings. The fireball sent debris flying and beams and plywood caught alight in a scorching secondary fire. At the same time, on the dance floor below, the lights went out. The music stopped immediately as the room was plunged into darkness. The 1,000 guests were confused for a brief moment, stumbling over each other and unable to see. Then the voice of a woman cried out, Fire! Fire! Immediately, panic ensued. As the terrified people ran towards the entryway in the darkness, the blaze began to light up the ballroom. The ceiling was engulfed in flames, and burning decor along with plywood pieces were raining down upon everyone in their dresses and suits as they tried to flee. Within three minutes, the entire roof of the building was engulfed. The inside of the building lacked ventilation. The smoke created from the burning decor was so thick that people began passing out and dropping to the floor, causing others to trip over and trample them. The situation turned from bad to worse as the 1,000 guests crowded into the entryway. Instead of running out the front door to the street, people stopped in the smoke and flames to find their coats. 
It was so ingrained upon them to protect their coats to avoid freezing to death that they couldn't just leave them behind in the fire. As this happened, the musicians also fought to move their large instruments out the door to safety. Drums and double basses were pushed past frantic partygoers in the chaos. A bottleneck formed, completely blocking the only exit to the outside. Guests in the back were smothered by smoke and ash, then trampled on the ground while those in front continued searching for their coats, completely unaware of the magnitude. A few miles away, an army intelligence officer in the American sector had just returned to his room when he heard a cacophony of sounds outside. The fire brigade was frantically attempting to warm the oil to start their fire trucks. The intelligence officer's phone rang, and he was ordered to report to the Karlsluist building as a translator. Rescuers rushed to the fire scene, but the trucks were still forced to obey the rules of yielding to British and American official vehicles. The fire brigade also knew they had to follow their 40 km per hour sector speed limit, no matter how big the blaze was. The British Army arrived on scene 15 minutes after the fire began. Anti-American and British sentiments were high after Germany had just lost a war to them. To add to the complications, most Germans didn't speak any English, and the British didn't speak German. The language barrier was hampering rescue coordination. The American intelligence officer was a German linguist, but just as he arrived, British Army firefighters were rushing into the building. As they entered, the roof collapsed, trapping them and killing them instantly. The local German fire brigade finally arrived with their trucks. The American intelligence officer translated between the British Army and the German fire brigade as they struggled to fight the fire together. The cold temperatures meant that fire hydrants were buried under a deep layer of snow and ice. As they dug the hydrants out of the snow, they found that they were frozen solid, unable to be used. Only one hydrant was functioning that night. Frantically, the fire brigade set up their hoses only to find the deep snow froze the water before it could be sprayed into the burning building. Finally, they decided to set up chairs from a nearby garden. They laid the fire hose across to keep it out of the snow so that the water could flow. Meanwhile, inside the burning dance hall, fatalities were rising. Some of the guests, realizing they were trapped without access to the single exit, had unsuccessfully tried to smash through the bricked-over windows. A few other terrified attendees found another door, but it led down to the cellar. Trying to escape the thick smoke and with nowhere else to go, they ran down the basement and hid there. Air Label, having escaped the first moments, made the desperate decision to run back to the building to find his cash box. Sadly, he never made it, succumbing to smoke inhalation in the chaos. The American intelligence officer later told his family that the Karlsluist fire was the worst thing he'd ever seen. He was a hardened infantry officer from 1943 to 1945 and participated in heavy combat in Europe. But despite those experiences, he said the one thing he could never forget was the screams of those who had made it out of the dance hall but had loved ones still trapped inside that they couldn't save. As dawn slowly arrived the following morning, the scene of devastation was overwhelming for the residents of Spandau. Rescuers searched the steaming rubble for anyone left alive, but instead found thick ash and parts of badly burned bodies. Heartbreak turned to relief for some when rescuers reached the cellar. The few people hidden there managed to survive under the collapsed building. Newspaper Der Spiegel reported that 88 people were killed in the fire, though they later reduced the number to 80. However, the exact death toll remains an estimate. Whether the British officers who died in the roof collapse were counted in the death toll has also been debated. The Karlsluist fire is considered the deadliest fire disaster in Germany since the air raids during the Second World War. Additionally, 150 people were injured in the fire. At the time, penicillin in Berlin was rationed. Medical supplies and antibiotics had to be gathered up and flown from the UK while the badly burned victims waited for help in local hospitals. Immediately following the fire, questions began to surface. Why were police performing safety inspections instead of the fire brigade doing them? Why were emergency services prohibited from operating in the manner needed? And what was to be done for people who lost ration or food coupon cards in the fire? To answer these questions, it is essential to understand the condition of post-war Berlin. The city of Berlin had been completely devastated by the time World War II came to an end. 
It had suffered civilian deaths numbering as many as 25,000 from the end-of-war air raids. As a result, most of the city's fire brigade had been killed while trying to save citizens from bombed buildings and the resulting fires. Life was a struggle for survival in Germany. Many buildings had been destroyed in the Allied bombings during the final months of the war, leaving a severe lack of infrastructure throughout Berlin. The fire brigade was no exception. The surviving fire trucks were old. Due to the freezing temperatures on the night of the fire, the oil in the truck's engines had to be heated before starting the trucks, taking 10 minutes or more. They didn't have radios for communication. Instead, they relied solely on the city's phone lines to share information about fires and coordinate their responses. This meant that residents had to know the phone number of the fire station closest to their location or wait for an operator to find it and connect them. The caller then had to hope someone at the station answered the phone. There was no centralized number like 911 to call for help, and no dispatch center existed. Firefighters from different stations couldn't coordinate unless they were next to a landline phone. So if one station's fire trucks were out on a run, it wasn't easily possible to request backup from a nearby fire station. To add to that, rules had been set in place by the British Army that seriously hampered the efforts of the emergency response vehicles. If a fire truck was driving down the street, it had to yield to any official army vehicles, even when responding to a fire. Furthermore, the fire trucks weren't allowed to travel above 40 kilometers per hour or 25 miles per hour. During the war, sirens weren't allowed because they were easily confused with the air raid siren and their use hadn't been approved again once the war ended. These limitations, combined with the sometimes poor conditions of roads in the war-ravaged city, seriously hampered any emergency response times. During the winter of that year, everyone worked hard to rebuild the missing infrastructure in post-war Berlin. Newly built and remodeled buildings were required to have safety inspections, but with the city being rebuilt at the same time after the bombings, inspectors were overwhelmed. Due to the devastation the fire brigade encountered at the end of the war, the police routinely performed fire inspections rather than experienced firefighters. They had approved the renovations and sealing decor at the Karls Lust building without knowing any better. A lack of infrastructure in post-war Berlin and outdated rules regarding the fire trucks directly led to the tragic fire. That was apparent to everyone involved in the rescue efforts before an investigation of the fire's cause even began. Political parties across the city raised money to help care for the injured. Berliners, who had next to nothing, chipped in what little they could for the victims. The Spandau district government gave out more than 800 coats to replace the lost ones, and ration cards were replaced, no questions asked. Author Lee Hutch, whose father was the American intelligence officer brought in to translate that terrible night, later wrote, It is often tragedy that necessitates change. And this is yet one more sad example. The most significant changes came about from the British military government. German emergency vehicles were no longer forced to yield to official government vehicles. The speed limit was abolished, and they were allowed to attach blue lights to the top of their trucks. A universal phone number for firefighters was established for the first time in Germany, allowing dispatchers to take the information and call the individual fire station. This made the citizens of Berlin safer and eased some lingering resentment between German citizens and their occupiers. Today, a high-rise building occupies the space where the Karls Lust was located, at 8 Hockenfelder Street. It is a quiet place that bears no evidence of the 1947 fire. Nearby, a memorial stone reads, In memory of those who perished in the fire disaster at the Karls Lust Inn on 8 February 1947. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.